Well, thanks for coming and for braving the weather. And welcome to Powering Your Blockchain with Patents. I'm Devorah Grazer. I'll be giving this talk. I've been doing this for 21 years. I've been programming since the age of 16. I spent four years programming at the Human Genome Project, and I am a US patent agent. But also, I spent two years in-house at a company. So I've been on both sides of the table. I know exactly what it's like to be on the other side of the table, wanting to understand better the patent strategy and also how to make your patent budget work. All right, this is what happens when you hang out too long with lawyers. Nothing in this presentation or any material provided, whether verbally or in writing, constitutes legal or patent advice. Now, I have urged everyone to please sign up, um, put your email address down. Please do not ask any private questions during the presentation, just general ones. Afterwards, we'll have a free consultation. You can ask all of your detailed questions then. But I do welcome general questions at any point during the presentation. If I'm going too fast, if you have a question about patents or blockchain, please feel free. So why bother with patents in the first place? I'm going to tell you a sad story. Pixi produced the first iOS phone app for photos. And they had a great first mover advantage. This was back in like 2009, so it was quite a while ago. But the small company had no money. But they had a lot of innovation. Now, you'd think this would be a happy story. With tons of innovation, couldn't a small company actually overcome the fact that they had no money? Unfortunately, Pixite was smashed, quite literally, by a competitor called Light Tricks. With little innovation, but they had a lot of money, and they had a huge marketing budget. So Pixite never filed for any patents. So Lightrix copied all of their ideas. And with their superior marketing budget, here, please feel free to join, have some food. Uh, thanks. So Lightrix copied all of their ideas. And in the end, Pixite was not able to continue. They're still continuing today, but they never grew to become the big company they could have become if they had protected their ideas with patents so their competitors could not have stolen them. Now, this brings us to a bigger problem. You are not alone. Software and hardware can be created anywhere in the world. But ambitious companies can be stopped by patents, as Xiaomi was stopped by Ericsson. Now, Xiaomi is the self Chinese cell phone company. Ericsson is the legacy cell phone company. Xiaomi wanted to sell their cell phones all over the world. They started in China. And then, as their first step outside of China, they went to India. Unfortunately, in India, they were stopped by Ericsson's patents. And they actually realized that they couldn't even sell in Europe or anywhere else because Ericsson and other cell phone companies had basically sewn up the entire world with their patents. So Xiaomi literally vowed revenge. The chairman vowed to file 10,000 patent applications in two years. And actually, I believe they accomplished that. By the end of 2015, they had filed nearly 5,000 patent applications. And they didn't just file them in China. Most of them were actually filed in the US, Europe, Japan, and Korea. Of the top five companies filing patent applications in Europe, only one is European. Two are Korean, one is Chinese, and one is American. In the US as well, large numbers of companies filing for patents are actually not American. So as you can see, competition is heating up all over the world, and companies are looking for any edge, any advantage to try to block their competitors and try to get a bit of an advantage over them. So we're going to discuss an intro to patents. We're going to talk about blockchain and patents, and then why patents don't have to be expensive. So here's why patents are a competitive advantage. What do all of these companies have in common? Online transactions, but also every single one of them has filed for a blockchain or Bitcoin patent. Amazon filed for seven, even eBay filed for two. Coinbase, of course, is a Bitcoin blockchain company, but these other companies are not, and yet they're in this space with patents. So patents provide the broadest protection for your idea. 
patents are the only type of idea protection that actually protects the core of your idea. Now, idea protection protects ideas. It protects intellectual property. But what is the problem with ideas? The problem with ideas is unlike physical property, which you can enjoy and share, and then control who accesses it, for example, with a lock and key, ideas only have value when they're shared. So how can you share your valuable ideas without having someone copy them? How can you make certain you get money for your ideas? Patents are the best way to do this. They're the best defense against copycats because you can use patents to block competitors from entering your market space. In other words, you can define a market niche that only belongs to you and to no one else, but only if you file for patents. So what is patentable? The top quote actually comes from a Supreme Court decision, anything under the sun made by the hand of man or woman. This includes software, hardware, and high tech, mechanical devices, proteins, etc. Basically, we're talking about technology. Technology is broadly patentable. It's in a patentable category. Uh, skipped one, there we go. Uh, uh. All right, sorry, I switched the order there. So what is not patentable? Music, images, books, and video, those are all protected by copyright. Names, logos, slogans, Coke, Coca-Cola, Coke the real thing, those are all trademarks, names under which you trade. Copyright and trademarks are much more narrow rights. You cannot block a market niche with these rights, but they do help you protect your idea further. Now, also what is not patentable is anything that you want to keep secret. Why is this? Because let's say you have a client server system, your software is on the server. If someone operating through the client cannot tell what's going on the server, maybe you want to keep that as a trade secret. But if your software is distributed, if it's downloadable, then of course everyone can access it, and at that point you can't keep it as a trade secret. So you have to have a good balance between the two. Go back. Oh, there we go. Patentability rules. How do you know what is patentable? First of all, does it fit into a patentable category? Software, hardware, etc. Is it novel or new? Is it inventive? Does it have that wow factor? That is a highly subjective rule. It is actually very difficult to tell what makes something a wow, and there have been many court cases over it. But basically, it has to be something out of the ordinary. Either it gives a synergistic effect, it makes something better, faster, or cheaper. Those help you make that wow factor that will make it patentable. But it also has to be well described in a patent application in each country. Patents are a per country right. Remember Zhao Mei filing all over the world? If they had only filed in China, only, their ideas would only be protected in China. If you file only in the US, your ideas are only protected in the US. So you need to think about which countries you actually want to operate in. Now, blockchain, of course, is international. As a result, you may want to file in more than just the US. You may also want to file in Europe or China or other countries in order to have that international protection. Otherwise, once someone is executing on your idea outside US borders, they can do so if you did not file a patent also outside the US. You can get a patent in four simple steps. Do a search. Find out if you're first. Uh, Google patent search is great. If you type in Google patents in Google, you'll find it. If you do Google advanced patent search, you can search by the name of your closest competitors. So if IBM is a close competitor, Coinbase is a close competitor, you can find those patents and see what else is out there. You prepare your drawings and your text, so the drawings tell the story of your idea, and the text tells the story of the drawings. You then file your patent application, and the examiner checks it to see if you can get a patent. Now, this may sound really simple, right? You file today, you have a patent tomorrow? Unfortunately, no. The problem is, how long does it take? Search doesn't take too long. The text and drawings, you can do that in a few weeks. Filing the patent application is now electronic, thank goodness. So you instantly get a number and a receipt the same day you file. But the examiner can take quite a few years to actually check the patent. This, however, is an advantage for a startup, especially in an area like blockchain, because the market's still developing. And because your startup's still developing. As long as your patent application hasn't been examined, you can argue that those very broad claims you put in, you deserve. 
And until the examiner says something, no one can say differently. Actually, in blockchain, things are heating up so much that there are companies that will publish as soon as they file for anything in blockchain, and they'll put a really broad description on their website of what's going on. So it's kind of like psychological warfare. Now, how do I know this? Because I have clients in blockchain. And every time a company does this, their investors come running to them and say, oh, no, we be able to do anything. Look at what they said they're doing. And then, of course, my clients come to me. So this is a big advantage for a startup that long lag time before the patent's actually examined. This is an example of a patent drawing. This is actually from one of Coinbase's patents. Coinbase is a blockchain company. This is from um, their wallet patent application. And it's basically showing a simple client server system. You have user devices over here. You have the internet, which is always shown as a fluffy cloud. It seems to be a requirement in patent drawings. You have lines connecting it, and then there's a minor computer system, some remote nodes. This is a schematic block diagram. There's no where in the world you're going to go and actually see this, but it's a description of the functions. So patent drawings don't have to be complicated. This is the level on which you need to do them in order to get your patent. Before you get a patent, your application is property. Your uh, filing for a patent can actually add a million dollars to your valuation as a startup. And the reason why is because it represents potential. The potential for your startup to block others. The potential for your startup to kind of shove everyone else out of the niche once the patent is granted. Patent pending, mark your website and app. Who says the, only your competitor should engage in that kind of psychological warfare? You should also let people know that you have filed to protect your ideas. If you file first, you can also block others from getting a patent. In the US, as in other countries, whoever files first wins. Yes, please sign up there. Um, and then, uh, first of all, we'll email you the presentation, the video, but also you can get a free consultation with me. I'm trying to avoid having private questions being asked during the presentation. OK. Um, one important point in terms of filing first is, let's say you work on your idea for three years, and I work on my idea for three months, but I file before you. If I file first, I win. In the US, it does not matter how long you're working on your idea. The US system urges you to either publish fast or to file fast, and I'll describe why in a moment. But sitting on your idea is absolutely the worst thing you can do. When to file? Outside the US, you have to file before you publish your idea. What is a publication? Giving a talk, giving a TED talk. Uh, putting something on your website, releasing your product, offering it for sale. In the US only, you are allowed to get a patent, file for a patent, up to one year after publishing your idea. So if you're certain you only want US protection, I urge you to publish quickly. Publish in detail. Take advantage of that one year grace period. It only applies to you. That's another way you can block your competitors. But of course, then you can't file outside the US. It is basically best to file as soon as you have a design of your idea. You do not need to build your idea to get a patent, especially not in software and hardware. You saw the drawing I showed you. That is just a design. So once you have the design, you are actually able to file for your patent and beat your competitors. We'll talk quickly about the blockchain and patents. Halfway through, oh, we're doing well. So can you patent Bitcoin or the entire blockchain? The answer, of course, is no. Satoshi Nakamoto, when he released the Bitcoin, he released it publicly, no patent, it's out there. You can't patent the entire blockchain idea. And yet, many companies are filing frantically for blockchain-related patents and ideas. So what are they filing for? The rush to file US patents in particular has been quite extreme. Um, I did a search, rather unscientific one, at the US Patent and Trademark Office for blockchain-related patents. Of all of the published patent applications, 25% were filed in Q1 of 2017 alone. Now, what does this mean? It shows that there's an extreme growth, but because the patent applications only publish 18 months after the first filing date, we're seeing an 18-month lag. This means that 18 months before Q1 2017, 
a lot of people were starting to file for a lot of patents, let's say towards the end of 2015. It shot up. So because of this rush, if you don't file for your blockchain patent quickly, you may find yourself getting shut out. Now in terms of who's filing in the US, Amazon filed for seven. Seven blockchain patents, not a blockchain company, but they're one of the bigger blockchain filers. Coinbase is a blockchain company, filed for seven, but even eBay filed too. Even Microsoft has filed for patents in this area. And other companies may have as well, and they may not have published yet. So the gold rush is on in order to get your patents and get everything filed quickly. So what can you protect, especially relating to blockchain? By the way, if anyone has any questions, you know, don't be shy. You can protect financial applications built on blockchain. So for example, this is Coinbase. They protected their wallet for bitcoins. And the earlier patent applications on the blockchain were mainly financial ones. But recently, there have been a lot more on logistics and contracts, smart contracts. A smart contract, of course, in the blockchain is one where you actually have the execution built into the blockchain itself. It makes it easier to enforce. In terms of logistics, how can you keep track of things? How do you know where things are? How can you trace them? Um, you and I were speaking before about renewable energy. Let's say you want to have a distributed microgrid with lots of suppliers coming in. On a central supply for a renewable energy uh, grid, it's very easy. You have one central supplier, everyone has meters, easy to keep track of who's owed what. If you have multiple points though, both putting power in and taking power out, how do you keep track of who's owed what? Because I might be a consumer one moment and a producer the next. So blockchain actually is very useful for that and there is actually a company in Brooklyn working on this idea. And of course security and encryption are also very popular. So these other types of non-fintech applications are becoming much more popular in blockchain and folks are basically racing to file everything they could in the blockchain area. So ownership in the blockchain is actually causing some interesting issues. Why is this? Well, for one thing, you do have smart contracts, but those could be between traditional parties. That is simply an enforcement mechanism for a contract. So that is causing fewer issues. What is causing very big problems with ownership in the blockchain is the DAO, Distributed Autonomous Organization. People have heard of the DAO? Um, Basically, this is a self-executing organization. There was a famous one based on Ether and then all the Ether got stolen because someone screwed up the code. Um, you know, every system works well on paper until you get humans in it, basically, and then it just all goes to heck in a handbasket. But the distributed autonomous organization, in theory, is self-executing. In theory, it can execute and do its job without input from humans or at least without being controlled by humans. So one question is, could a DAO own a patent. What happens if a DAO is executing someone else's idea? Can they be held liable for infringement of a patent? So these questions were raised and weren't answered because can a DAO own anything? I don't know how many people here heard about the monkey selfie. There was a macaw monkey that took a picture of itself using a camera, playing with the camera, took a picture of itself, baring its teeth which in monkeys is actually a sign of aggression. Maybe he didn't like the photographer. And the photographer whose camera it was said, well, I own this picture. I own the copyright to the picture. Now, if you remember at the beginning, we talked about copyright is a kind of idea protection for images, videos, etc. The way copyright works, unless you as the creator of, let's say, a photograph, sign over your rights to a company, or to someone else in exchange for money, you, the photographer, own that photograph. So the person whose camera it was said, I own the photograph. Peta went to court and said, no, the monkey owns the photograph. The monkey owns the copyright in the photograph. Now, the judge was not about to get into a discussion about monkeys, creativity, artist, artistry. The judge simply said, no, a monkey is not a legal person. Now, a legal person does not have to be an individual. A company can be a legal person. A legal person is an entity under the law that can own property and can buy and sell property. So the monkey was not considered to be a legal person, so the monkey could not own copyright and therefore could also not own a patent. 
So is a DAO, a distributed autonomous organization, a legal person under the law? And the answer is we don't know, actually, if this is true or not. This question has not been raised yet. Well, yes? I was going to say, it hasn't been raised yet, right? It has not been raised yet um, because it hasn't yet gone into court, as far as I know, over this. Typically, these issues are settled in court. Now, because the distributed autonomous organization can execute by itself, some have argued it is not under the jurisdiction of the court. The courts, of course, will beg to differ. They think pretty much everything's under their jurisdiction. And certainly at points where the DAO interacts with humans, the humans are under the jurisdiction. Can you give an example of what a DAO would be? Well, for example, a DAO is a company which, is which executes on a certain number of functions. So let's suppose, for example, you had a company, a DAO, and you wanted to bring in investors and you were going to trade. You could invest the DAO with an algorithm, which would say, okay, this is when you buy, this is when you sell. People bring the money to the DAO, they own parts of it, and then the DAO goes and does its thing. It basically executes autonomously. Could it be something like an online trading system then? It is actually more than that. I'm oversimplifying it, okay. like a lot, yeah. like a lot, a lot. <laughs> Well, it has to be able to do more than that. It actually has to be able to undertake all the functions of a company. Okay. Not just, a, like a trading algorithm is under the control of a human, ultimately. The idea of the DAO is that it would not be under the control of a human. That's why when all the coin was stolen, they had to kind of reboot it and try to get all the coin back. <laughs> it was a bit awkward. Um, but there is no question about whether or not a DAO could own something. In other words, is it a machine or is it something independent that can have ownership? And that question has not yet been raised in court. So further research is obviously needed in this area and that's actually one of the areas I'm looking at. Oh, if you sign up, I'll send you the presentation and you can also um, talk with me by phone if you're interested to ask questions about patents or anything else. So what and when to patent? What do you want to patent? The heart of your business, the part of your business that if it were taken from you, if someone were to copy it, remember like poor Pixite, where their ideas were literally stolen right out from under them, that's the part you want to protect. The part of your business you can't do without. Okay, good. What else do you want to patent? Well, anything the user experiences. Users don't really care about your fancy behind the scenes algorithms. What they want is the solution to their problem. How they perceive that solution, that is the value that they're perceiving. So what the user experiences, what the user is able to understand and what the user sees, that is what you also want to protect with your patent. Because you don't want your, cop your copycat to come and copycat the idea and take that away from you. You shouldn't wait to file because otherwise someone else could file first and block you. Snapchat, now known as Snap. Um, you know, when you're working with their app, if you hold down the camera button, it switches to video automatically, if you hold it down for long enough. They almost lost that patent. There was a 19-day filing difference between them and a competitor. 19 days. Now, they were filing under the old rules, so they were able to, they had an argument over who was first to invent. But nowadays, the company on the wrong side of that 19-day filing divide will lose. The company on the right side will win. So you obviously want to be on the right side of those 19 days. And the fact is, you don't know what other people are filing. Everything is secret for 18 months. It's like a big black hole. So what has been happening, especially in blockchain areas which are hot, my clients are filing many, many things. And at the end, we're all going to see what publishes and who's basically done what. Of course, like I said, some companies mention what they're doing a lot earlier just to kind of get the advantage on other companies. Now I'm going to talk about why patents actually don't have to be expensive. So why are patents expensive? Imagine you could only get clothing by going to a tailor and having a custom-made suit. You couldn't go to the store and buy anything off the shelf. Clothing would obviously be very expensive. Back in the days when that is what happened, people maybe had two suits of clothing. You know, one for every day and one for special dress occasions. Well, patents are still being done the same way. They're being done completely manually. And because most lawyers charge by the hour, 
They have no reason to be efficient. Why should they use less manual labor? Because they can charge by the hour for everything, for every single person who works on the patent. We, on the other hand, do a lot with automation, and we charge fixed price. So we are a lot more efficient, and we're also a lot less expensive. We are working on fully automating the patent and trademark filing process. At the moment, the automation we have is more behind the scenes. But we are working to make it as efficient as possible for you. I recommend starting with a provisional application. This, in my opinion, is the best way to start. Now, a provisional application is an application you file in the US. It lasts for one year. It is not examined, and it has far fewer rules. So why is this such a good idea? Because it allows you to get your foot in the door. Everything that you file in a provisional application gets the date that you file that application. So if you file a lot of stuff in a provisional application, you're first to file. But because it's not examined, there are fewer rules, it's a lot less expensive, and also takes a lot less of your time. Now, let's suppose you decide, I only want to file in the US. So you publish first. You can, by the end of one year, still file a provisional and get a second year. It actually gets even better. Let's say you publish in the US your idea. Well, everything you publish, you can only file in the US. At the end of the year, you file for a provisional application. But you include some new ideas. Well, you can now take that provisional application in another year and file it not just in the US, but also in other countries for the new ideas. So you can get two years to figure out what it is you want to do. You can still potentially file at least part of it outside the US, and you can save a lot of money. So this system really gives the most bang for the buck for startups. Uh, small ad, we actually offer a provisional application for $2,500, including everything, if you do the drawings. And if you want us to do the drawings and do more of the work, we also have a concierge package for $5,000. All right, that was just the ad. <laughs> um, so I really do recommend this, especially if you want to file fast. You can get this done in a few weeks. So can you do this yourself? Well, you can, but you need to know the following. First of all, idea protection can be complicated. You need to know what you want to file, when you want to file it, are you filing too quickly? Usually not, as long as you have a design, uh, but sometimes you might want to wait, but then if you're in a very hot area, that can be dangerous, so you have to understand your strategy. Really, you need to have a strategy. You need to have a strategy because that strategy will help you not only decide what it is you need to do, but also explain it to investors. I mean, patents are a piece of property. Investors want to see not only what have you filed, but what was your strategy behind it? Why do you believe this idea can be protected? And why do you believe this patent will be a valuable piece of property for you? You also need to be confident that you're making the right choice. One of the biggest problems I see with startups is they don't make a decision. They just say, well, we'll deal with it later. But not making a choice in the world of patents and idea protection is making a choice. If you publish your idea and you wait more than a year, you're blocked. If you wait to file and someone else files before you, you're blocked. Um, actually, one of the saddest uh, questions I saw in Quora was a SaaS company, which was about to sign a deal with an investor, and then it fell through at the last minute because their competitor had a patent application that published. And the investor went to them and said, look, these guys got a patent application. And the other company thought it was too broad, but who knows? You can't tell. Why would the investor go invest in that SaaS company instead of the competitor? So they actually lost the deal completely. So you need to be confident that you're making the right choice, because not making a choice is unfortunately the same as making a choice, but maybe not the best one for your company. Well, that's all I have. Um, please do be certain to sign up because I will send you the presentation and also the video and also have a private session to answer your questions. Um, does anyone have any more questions on patents or trademarks or anything else? Are you planning on expanding to the copyright and trademark? Yes, we also handle copyright and trademark as well. Uh, the reason why we do is because many times clients do come to us and they want to have a unified strategy for doing so. Um, for software stocks, for example, copyright is particularly important for code. You can protect the actual code with 
copyright. That can be an advantage if you want to very quickly shut someone down who's just literally ripped off your code. Um, other types of copyright can also be helpful for certain types of startups if they want to actually protect the content of what they're doing. Trademarks can be useful. One advantage of trademarks is you can file after you start using the trademark. Now, some countries like China are first to file. Um, there was a, I don't know if you heard this, there was a great story involving Apple and the iPad. Apple thought it owned the iPad trademark, but someone else had filed first in China. And Apple said, well, we were using it more and doing stuff, and China said, um, we're first to file for trademark, and they filed first, um, sorry. And so Apple had to spend a lot of money to buy back the iPad trademark. But that is a more unusual situation because they waited actually quite a while before going into China. Normally with trademarks, I'd, the bigger problem is not using someone else's trademark by accident for a startup and then they can file for trademark protection later. It's not expensive, but many times startups end up changing names and logos and everything else. However, patents, of course, it is best to file before you publish unless you want to invoke that one year grace period. So that's really the difference between the two things. Yes? In terms of the usage of the patent, mm -hmm. um, if you have the patent on the blockchain, yeah. however it's used on the blockchain versus you know, just a normal day-to-day... You know, -day. That depends on how it's written. Okay. That's a good question because some applications, for example, really you need to have, absolutely can only do it on the blockchain. Let's say you want to have a smart contract, for example. I suppose in theory you could do it without the blockchain. You'd have to explain how else you'd want to do it. Um, the idea, however, is not to limit it to any one particular execution. I mean, you know, we've got Ethereum, and we've got Bitcoin, and we've got all these other guys. We have some proprietary ones. Um, there's like Hyperledger. There's all kinds of different ways to actually use blockchain and distributed ledgers more generally. So you'd want to write the patent application to encompass all those ways of doing it. But if your idea really depends on having, let's say, a distributed ledger, then it'll be limited to um, concepts where there are distributed ledgers. If you think you can do it without it, then you want to explain that other way as well within your patent application. Uh, what are your thoughts on property uh, with the blockchain? Uh, with the DAO? the Distributed Autonomous Organization. You know, in theory, a DAO can own property, but I don't know how enforceable it would be or what it would mean, because I don't know if a DAO is a legal person. Were you here when I talked about the monkey selfie? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. so basically, um, that, that actually did show that there was a limit to entities that could actually own property as legal persons. Um, so I don't know if a DAO could actually do that. I don't know if a DAO could actually own a patent. It's one of the areas I'm looking into. Because I did, I was looking actually again at the patent law involving assignments. In an assignment, the inventor who invented an idea is assumed to own the patent. The inventor has to transfer those rights through assignment. And the patent laws are pretty much assuming that the folks involved or the entities involved in assignments are all legal persons. Like, the question wasn't even raised if it would not be a legal person. So it would need to be, a DAO would have to be considered to be a legal person in order to actually own a patent. So that's really the question that would come up. Now, if it was assigned to the DAO, the DAO's not a legal person, it becomes actually a little bit confusing as to what, what would be going on. Like, would the assignment simply not hold in that case, for example? Maybe it would revert back to the inventors? Um, at, that actually is not clear to me, and I have to do some more research into that as well. But I think it's going to become a bigger question because if a DAO, Let's say a DAO were to own a factory. Could the DAO own the factory? If someone tries to take the factory away from the DAO, is that what is known as a taking, which would require compensation? I don't know. And those questions haven't yet been resolved. And another, sorry, uh, with the patent, if, it's, if you fire it internationally, mm -hmm. uh, how is it enforced? Like, where, where you per country. So for example, if you file for a patent in China, you can enforce it in China. By the way, 95% of all patent lawsuits in China are between two Chinese companies. The reason for that, it is much less fun when someone else steals your stuff. So 95% of the time in China, there are two Chinese companies that are banging their heads together over patents. Um, if you want to get protection in Europe, you have to file in Europe. I know it's not a country, but it is considered to be a country for the purpose of filing. For the purpose of enforcement, not quite there yet. They're working on having a European-wide 
patent so that you could actually also enforce it. And of course, in the US, you know, a patent in the US is enforceable in all of the states of the US. Let's say okay. there's a US company that is willing to operate in China. Mm -hmm. So we have a patent in China. How efficient are they in terms of protecting uh, the rights of a foreign company? They're actually the Chinese judiciary when it comes to patents is very even handed. Um, as, is the are, as are the Chinese patent examiners. I have not seen any disadvantage you know, coming in as a foreign company, representing clients, they're very fair. There is still a lot of questions because the whole Chinese patent system is only 20 years old. So what they did was they um, imported a lot of laws and regulations from actually from Britain. They did base, part of what was based on that. But they also accept American precedent, that is American court cases. So they're still kind of trying to sort out exactly where all the boundaries are. One thing I do tell my clients and has worked very nicely is if they have a Chinese partner, what I will recommend is they'll have an agreement that after that Chinese partner meets certain milestones, typically involving money, they paid a certain amount of money, a certain number of things have happened, then my client will turn that patent over to the Chinese partner, of course, my client will keep on filing. It's one way to make certain everyone agrees on what the end goal is and then the Chinese partner can go and you know, bash everyone else over the head with the uh, patent to do. So that's usually where the difficulty actually comes into. I mean, I know Apple and some company um, did complain over this, but I think it was more involving the interpretation of what the patent rights mean because once you're in court, it gets really subjective. You know, are you infringing? Are you not infringing? Is it the same? Is it different? It seems so clear on paper. And then you get some lawyers together and all of a sudden there's a big fog and no one really knows. And in China, that's compounded by the fact that they have such a recent history. So it's kind of hard to know exactly what's happening there. Yeah. Yes? Um, my friend was asking because I told her I was coming to. OK, awesome. Um, would you recommend any meetup groups or um, people who are interested in, in like the blockchain or anything that you may have seen online that may have struck your eye? Well, there are actually a lot of meetup groups on blockchain in New York City. I mean, there's a ton of them. Um, for women, I was just at Women in Blockchain. Yep, men are also invited, by the way, it's fine. <laughs> but they had a really interesting talk. Um, there was Brooklyn Microgrid. They're the ones who had renewable energy, where you're both a producer and consumer. How do you keep track? And they were using blockchain. But there's tons and tons and tons of them. If you simply look at Meetup and in blockchain, there's a lot of different ones. Some of them are more on coding. Um, the one last night was more talking about the philosophy of the system, like not just the code, but also what it does, why does it do it, and how do we want to direct it. And so that's where like, the, one of the questions came up was ownership. They want to be community-based. And then it's like, well, who owns it? How is it owned? Maybe Con Ed has to maintain it, but to what extent can they have control? Or is, are they just sitting like, as a layer on top of it? Like, um, I think it's like Green Mountain. It's like you can buy energy from them, that kind of a thing. Is that the deal, or is it something else? So blockchain has like, a lot of possibilities, but also has a lot of questions as to what exactly is going on. For example, with the Ethereum, with the DAO there, when the Ether was stolen, they just simply reset it. OK, but that kind of means it's not immutable. You know, can you rely on it if someone can push, oops, we made a mistake and push the reset button? OK, I don't know. But these are the kinds of questions which do uh, come up, as well as, of course, the hard uh, core, uh, coding questions as well, like how exactly are you going to execute on this? Any more questions? Well, if there are no more questions, I'd like to thank everyone so much for coming. Please do make certain that you sign up so that I can answer your questions in private. And I'd be really happy to also answer any questions afterward. Thank you so much. Mm -hmm.